Okay, so thank you for being here. Uh, and sorry for the delay. It's, um, I got lost. <laughs> it's a huge, it's a huge conference center. And I don't know you, but I couldn't find uh, the Sali on, on the map. Um, or Passy, Passy. All right, so um, I'm welcome and thank you for being here. Um, I think you're here to learn about how collaborating, um, how to best, uh, how to improve collaboration inside your companies. And I've been talking to quite a bit of uh, managers in the past months to understand exactly how collaboration works inside companies, inside corporations. And um, because my role at the OpenStack Foundation is to exactly help companies uh, understand the OpenStack way of doing things and uh, integrate developing teams, development teams inside the, the, the OpenStack um, workflows and processes. And y you it's interesting to me today uh, to l follow the keynotes uh, by Jim Zemlin, and he was saying exactly what uh, the Linux Foundation uh, recently reported, that uh, business managers and executives of uh, companies, members of the Linux Foundation, they've been saying that it's very important uh, or somewhat important for over 90% of them uh, to collaborate inside uh, for their business. and. Uh, not only it's important, it's something also that is going to be increasing over the next years. So with uh, for OpenStack, this means that we, uh, we, you know, we all start to get better. Uh, we need to get better and uh, we need to get better at collaboration. And uh, I may have some suggestions for you in this. And uh, I'll start by giving out the results of my uh, early investigations, I would say. The early results is that you will, in order to improve the collaboration, most likely companies will need to, uh, inside your company, inside your team, you will have to tweak how you develop products and, and uh, how you serve your customers. Uh, you have to start thinking about how um, your company and your team is not just your team, it's also part of a, uh, another, someone else's team and you have to expect results over the long term, it's prob most likely you're not gonna have uh, short cuts or short term results uh, very easily. So I, I give you um, a little bit of uh, an overview of what, how OpenStack is made so that you, you know, the things that, those, those explanations, those early answers uh, will make a little bit more sense. So, you know, we, what surprises a lot of people approaching OpenStack for the first time is that it's got no uh, traditional management structure. You cannot easily buy into um, a, a seat. Or you cannot easily become the uh, owner of anything in OpenStack. You you earn uh, influence, and you because because. Every most of the positions, you know, the technical committee or the board directors or even the user committee, um, we all get elected. I mean, most most of uh, these, except the platinum members from the board of directors, every other position is an elected uh, position. And so you can think of OpenStack more of a representative democracy than than uh, a traditional traditional management structure. And um, so OpenStack is also made with a very predic predictive, um, uh, predictable rhythm. Uh, we release every six months. We've been releasing for uh, quite regularly for many years now. Uh, this cadence keeps the whole team uh, working on OpenStack upstream, very focused, and uh, helps with uh, also the newcomers to, to have that sort of ideas of when things will happen and, and what will happen. So for example, this is th on, the, on the right, you know, the picture shows the calendar for the past release, Juno. We met in Atlanta in May, mid-May, for a week, just like we're meeting now in Paris for, for a week, to define what the roadmap will look like uh, in uh, the design sessions, which will start tomorrow for the next release. And then after, after Atlanta, after meeting in person, we all go home with ideas and things to do. And uh, over the next months, pretty much every six weeks or four to six weeks, we get 
new uh, milestones until we reach a very important time of the year of the release cycle where uh, we don't accept any more feature uh, proposed media proposals or um, everything that is also work in progress needs to be stopped by um, th the third milestone. And at that point, we start cutting release candidates and uh, call for testing. And then we have the release, and then we start over. So once uh, we go home after the design summit, we have a we start working on a on features or bug fixes, and they all share more or less the same the same road the same uh, cycle. We have something that is called a blueprint that gets filed. With the blueprint, we we want to have also specifications proposed, and the specifications are a larger description of what the feature will look like, more like um, an architecture type of um, document. And these specifications get discussed. They get discussed openly. They get discussed across uh, all of the participants in the in the collaboration space. And once the specification is approved, then um, this the blueprint w that depends on, on the specification gets also scheduled for a release into one of the milestones. And then the real work starts, or the next phase of the real work starts, where code gets developed and proposed up for review again until it's merged and the blueprint is closed. And uh, each code patch and each change of proposals goes through this review workflow, which I'm not going to give you details about. But it's this is just to show you the, the complexity of uh, how things get made. Because you know, in the end, uh, what we realize by looking at the amount of people participating in today, uh, OpenStack is huge. Um, not only millions of lines of codes and uh, 2,600 contributors to uh, over 180 code repositories make, make uh, OpenStack extremely comp big. It's also something that moves uh, very fast. Uh, so we release every month. You, s you heard this, this morning during the keynotes, a lot some of the users and super users were mentioning how every release comes with new feature sets. And, and uh, that creates stress, create this velocity. The complexity also of OpenStack has been mentioned during the keynote, so I'm not going to spend too much time because it doesn't matter how you look at OpenStack, whether by layering the services on top of one of another or you show at the individual architecture. Um, OpenStack happens to be uh, big, complex, and fast. So that, that's what I think when I think of big, complex, and fast. And y y the users and the newcomers to the community trying to do that, they, they can get uh, hurt. Uh, and looking at speaking of downstream, so the ecosystem of OpenStack, the ones that join OpenStack, why do we do it? Why do they do it? Um, and I kind of think of the large picture of the ecosystem as made of two large chunks. The large uh, one chunk is uh, companies that are producing something uh, based on OpenStack and something and, and companies that are consuming something based on OpenStack. And, and I say companies, but it could be departments or teams within the same company that have these different roles. Uh, the producers inside the produ producers of OpenStack, there are two main uh, pieces. Um, one is made of company groups and companies and firms who are deeply committed in OpenStack, and these are producing probably 90% of the code. It's, it's, these are the large chunk, the top 10, the top 20 contributors to OpenStack that you see quoted in statistics. And uh, the companies involved are uh, developing, uh, contributing less, but they're the largest majority of the companies. And if you notice, all the, the pieces of the puzzle have the same size, because I don't, I don't think that any one is less important than the other. Um, Operators are consuming OpenStack in terms they're consuming whatever is produced upstream, and they eventually have to plug into the upstream pieces. And we are starting to have a look also at end users. These are developers of SDKs or consumers of SDKs to develop um, applications on top of OpenStack. And we just started to look at this, at the, this group. Now, most likely, and uh, or 
but based on my experience, companies tend to have this sort of a approach to uh, the products uh, they, they, devel they, they develop. And they have in mind a very classic product value chain where everything is consumed and produced and procured within the boundaries of the firm. And this is an approach that uh, starts really to fade and uh, uh, put into crisis as a model when you look at, uh, at collaborations and especially with the within the OpenStack ecosystem. Because technology development and procurement, for example, um, when, you, when you get to, to OpenStack and you get to open source in general, you start touching things um, that are much larger. So for in the OpenStack collaboration, uh, you don't have uh, only pieces that touch that touch and interface with the firms only, and uh, things uh, need to be integrated across the company boundaries. And um, so that vision, that approach with monolithic way of procuring, de developing new um, new products, so R&D or procurement of software really gets into, into the way. And friction accumulates um, when, when you have that idea that everything depends from uh, a direct uh, line chain of command inside a company. Friction starts to accumulate uh, around all these places especially. So when the specification is proposed, when a specification is discussed, when a blueprint is assigned or, or for, for a deadline and during the uh, code development life cycle. And uh, friction accumulates because managers expect to give an order and have it executed by their, the people that they depend, uh, they, that they um, control. Uh, and they have a long history of uh, being, being uh, 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 a long history of obedience from their from their um, employees. But when, when, uh, when someone is assigned a task and that task, the execution of that task depends on someone else's approval um, outside of company boundaries, those, uh, that, that time and uh, at that place, that's where friction accumulates. And I noticed that the companies that end up succeeding more in uh, developing OpenStack and contributing to OpenStack are those where uh, the development cycles and, and uh, the model for to approach for new product development is more open. And this is um, uh, the open innovation chart and that I have blatantly um, uh, uh, used here to describe what some of these models where the OpenStack collaboration effort is part of a larger way a cultural approach and uh, and business processes and that are inside the firm, inside the companies that take large advantage of collaboration in in many sense. So the in in uh, in a research and development case, um, collaboration is is allowed to happen inside the research phases until you know with inf sourcing of other places until you get to the new market or you serve the current market with new products. When, when companies, with companies that have this sort of vision for product development, these are the ones that are, doing, uh, have a, are having best results inside OpenStack and they're not spinning their wheels. So simple, res simple suggestions that I have for, for, um, for you, uh, if you're interested in, in is that Successful companies in OpenStack keep the tempo. So they have they have aligned their product release cycles. They have aligned their um, services um, also on the development of the OpenStack release. Since it's uh, OpenStack releases very clearly, very very predictably every six months, we have milestones. We have feature freezes that we publish at the beginning of the release cycle. The companies that keep that in mind, they have more success uh, stories to share. Um, the other important thing that I noticed as a pattern, the companies that are successful at contributing to OpenStack and have less friction when they have people who work inside the OpenStack community and they are known. 
because in the end, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. And it's something that we tend to forget. Um, participations in uh, summits, participation in um, all the meetings that we have online, all the relevant conversations, um, doing code reviews for specifications and, and uh, actual code. Those are the things, those are the activities that tend to have a large impact on your developers get known by other people inside the community. Um, we have governance spaces where also you can participate. Another, another thing, another approach that I notice works very well with uh, developers is uh, when, when teams are organized so that they adopt the open source principles. Something that really doesn't work is having agile teams, scrum teams, working and uh, working inside the same room, developing features, discussing architecture, um, shipping code, all inside one room without sharing any, any result of those uh, in-person meeting with, um, with the outside world. Uh, and this is something that um, is really disruptive and doesn't really help the, the collaboration because you have to think that OpenStack never sleeps. It's literally a community that covers all time zones. And uh, when you're meeting in one room and you're making a decision inside one room and you're not sharing the results of the, the, that decision outside on a mailing list or anything that doesn't have a URL, you're not very. You're not really doing a very good job at uh, communicating with the others, who might be surprised to see your code being proposed without a discussion. And if your team, even if it's inside the same company, without this inside the same time zone, if your team doesn't get used to the idea of having to share something over a URL, um, you you're probably going to have friction accumulating. You're going to be spinning your wheels. Um, asynchronous communication is also something that helps. So uh, we all love stand-up meetings because they're short, because they're on point. Uh, but having having um, um, collab communication over email uh, is something that needs to be uh, also um, educate. I mean, it's an education process that would help. Um, locking points that need to be avoided is also something that uh, I've seen happening quite often uh, where every large contribution from one firm comes uh, after it's finished inside the firm itself. And uh, when it's pushed up for review uh, to the OpenStack community, it's usually um, refused or it doesn't have, it's, it's not accepted immediately. So pushing the reviews, uh, pushing the code as a work in progress is a very good idea. Uh, we had um, people asking me how, how to do that, how uh, recently on, on the mailing list. It's something that needs to be adopted uh, and it's a very good thing to do. Uh, because there are things that create disappointing results and it's quite visible from my uh, point of view when uh, there are teams organized around the product cycle internal at the firm. Um, I've had uh, to rescue uh, a couple of uh, companies recently because they came up with uh, an idea of uh, adding support from to one of their hardware piece. Um, and uh, the whole decision to join, to add that driver, that little piece of code to support OpenStack inside their company for that particular product line was done inside the company itself. We, we were never contacted, they never reached out to us. And wha what happened was that they, they had the release cycle, the, the release time for that uh, product at the same time of uh, uh, OpenStack, more or less, being released. So it was around April. But what they didn't know was that before you can land even 200 lines of code in a driver, so it, uh, in a very separated, confined environment, they have to, I mean, the, the code needs to be reviewed by others. And, uh, and there is, for these reviews to happen, they need to go through uh, feature freeze like anybody else, string freeze like everybody else. And uh, 
when they proposed the code, that code got rejected, they missed the deadline, and they couldn't ship the product with OpenStack support as they promised to their customers. Um, they also made another classic mistake is to have only one engineer allowed to contribute upstream. And uh, this engineer was actually being the performances and uh, the performance review for this engineer were only measured for results that were um, or things that he would do inside the company. So this person was had no incentive to uh, do code reviews or for others inside the OpenStack community. It had no incentive to even read the mailing list. And in fact, he totally missed a deadline, not only because, because the, ma the mailing list is the main place where a deadline was moved. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something that happens. Um, and uh, we I also noticed another company uh, where developers were actually physically blocked from accessing the communication lines with the OpenStack community, that there were firewall rules, and they now they removed them. Uh, that prevented IRC communication to happen. Um, Git review was also blocked because it works on a, on a strange port, I mean, a non-standard port. Um, we have places uh, in remote Asia where, uh, well, in, in China, uh, some, some most of the developers cannot access directly some places of OpenStack.org because it's being blocked by the Great Wall, the Great Wall, uh, the Great Firewall. And um, um, I've seen another, another company where every single commit, every single proposal for a change had to go through one single person. So uh, there were uh, the individual engineer, there were teams of engineers, large teams of 15, 20 people working on features, but they could not propose the patches themselves. They had to go through one person. So this created a very strong incentive for these teams to work on large changes before they passed them to the one person who was then allowed to contribute to patch upstream. And during all these processes, the uh, there was a, um, gosh, I don't know. Oh, so during all these uh, steps, the um, uh, the original the original authors of the code they were not allowed they were they they were not allowed to participate into the the conversations, the discussions, and the debates that happened for them for their own code. So that was really uh, complicated. And these are definitely ways to uh, have huge collisions of interest, large masses, large body uh, going at different speeds. So, you know, going back to the short answers that you need to tweak your organization, you need to change the way you think uh, of your uh, incentives, uh, your business processes, um, your development processes. The short, there are, there, is, there are some shortcuts that you can take before you can definitely change the way you do business. And one simple way of doing things is to join the upstream training that we do before each summit. Uh, we, we did one session in uh, Atlanta. We had three sessions uh, before Paris over this uh, weekend. We're definitely going to do it again in Vancouver. And these training sessions are offered by the OpenStack Foundation to developers in order to get exposed to the way of OpenStack, the way we do things. So in it's one two days training. The first day, we teach how to use the s the development tools, the very simple, fairly uh, fairly simple, easy to grasp I mean for a developer. Uh, but we also teach the more difficult things that the the social interactions, um, all the all the processes that are complicated to to get used to. Uh, we also play a lot with Legos, and you, you're going to see some of the results of the uh, Lego exercise in the in the expo hall uh, these days. It's, it's on the, on the table. Another very simple tweak that you can do in your companies, in your organization, is to give man to free your developers to do the work that they want to do on their own. Um, this is, you know, some people refer to this as the 80-20 rule that Google kind of um, is uh, uh, known to, to have. 
So four days of uh, four days, your developers can work, have to work on whatever you tell them to work on, and for the, the fifth day, they can do whatever they want. And when they do whatever they want, they if you tell them to work on OpenStack, you know they they have free time on OpenStack, and this will buy them visibility. This will enable them to be visible to others, and when they're visible to others, they can they uh, earn karma. They get they earn possibility to influence things, and with that karma, they can spend it when it's time for their code to be. Uh, accelerated or you know fast forwarded into granted an exception exception or uh, things similar and what you end up gaining is lots of avoid you know being rejected uh, nobody likes that to, to be told that they're late their contribution is late um, developers that are free to use their time are also going to be the ones that will be reading the mailing list and get uh, and know the deadlines. Um, uh, you you get also if you follow if you your developers are aware of what the surroundings are, that you you get more um, less chances to to replicate work that has been done by someone else. And one thing that happens is sometimes is that uh, developers pick a bug to work on. They go on and work, and when they go back and they try to submit the patch, they realize that someone else already fixed it. Um, because the speed of OpenStack is uh, such that s these things sometimes happen. Um, right, so your, t your team will be fixing stuff. And uh, yeah, the feature freeze is something that really surprises every a lot of people every time, although it's predictable again. but. Um, the uh, during feature freezes where everything really uh, at the end of the release cycle uh, things get complicated and uh, lots of people ask for an exception, but those exceptions are only granted to the ones that are known to the uh, technical leaders for being able to deliver good code on time. And I uh, underline good code on time because good code is something that is rare to come to come across. So going back to the short answers to remind you, you know, you will, m in order to minimize friction, you will definitely need to uh, tweak how you develop product and how you serve your customers. It's uh, something that you cannot do without. You cannot keep doing business the way you used to, uh, without and and expect to be collaborating into OpenStack successfully without friction. Definitely, we need to th start thinking about measuring things outside the corporate boundaries. Um, so there is there are talks uh, during the rest of the day in this uh, in this room about how to measure con community contributions uh, so you can keep track of the work that your developers do outside of the uh, of your organization and you can incorporate that data um, back into your into your reporting and your KPIs and also think about long term it's not something that you change in the tweak and you immediately get results uh, you you need to have that long term strategic view when you when you decide to invest in openstack um so i'm early and uh i'm available for questions and comments i kind of thought about that you would want to have uh, questions there is a microphone in the room um if anyone Yeah. Can you remember? I don't think this is on. Can we? Is it up now? Better? Is it now? Okay. Um, I'm Randy Moser. I work at Rackspace right now on OpenStack deployments for the public cloud. And one of the things you commented about the lack of project product management and architecture and part of the governance. Um, whereas a lot of the challenges that companies are going to be facing is with aligning their product development process, which is very frequently pushed through by product managers and product owners. Do you have recommendations on how, how to align those, how to engage? Because a product manager may not be technical enough to engage directly with an engineer on OpenStack. They don't always speak totally. the same language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have recognized we have recognized that we haven't been good at tracking and 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 um, 
involving product managers inside the OpenStack communities. And uh, we're starting this week, actually. So we have a meeting starting at 2 for the first time at 2 p.m. with uh, product managers of OpenStack-related products and services. We want to get to know them and uh, enable product managers to uh, influence the roadmap in OpenStack or even you know, just simply tell us what we need to do in order to help them out. But so um, that's the, the one thing that we're doing. The other thing that we want, uh, I mean, the other suggestion is uh, that we, we, d we need to improve also on the community side. We need to make it better, make it easier uh, to communicate deadlines. For example, the one thing that happened this cycle that w one of the projects, Neutron, moved the deadline, anticipated the deadline for feature freeze without on just simply saying it on the mailing list and without a larger communication was a mistake, I think, um, that we will try not to repeat anymore uh, so that product managers can be, can be informed. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking of uh, also come up with a keep investigating the keep this research that I started uh, and try to come up with uh, more um, more detailed suggestions and more detailed use cases than what I could cram into a, a 25 half an hour presentation now because there are some companies that are being better than others they all face the same challenges I mean don't get me there is no silver silver bullet there is no simple solution it, it's um, it's a complicated it's complicated and requires changes in the culture changes in uh, business processes it requires a very strong alignment in uh, strategy from the top who the whoever makes makes the decision to join OpenStack to the bottom to the individual developers and right now I mean until recently the the main um, the main driver, or we counted a lot on the goodwill of the developers themselves to be able to do the right thing uh, inside inside OpenStack and inside the corporations. But we're getting to the point where this doesn't scale, or we, we saturated the amount of uh, n developers that are used to open source in general and to OpenStack in specific. They're, they're not anymore. So the new companies that are joining OpenStack every day, they don't have access to those talents or to those educated uh, people, and they need to learn. And uh, the learning process right now, it's too complicated. Sure. Is this working? Uh, hi, I'm. A, my name is Tasos. I'm a student, and I was a little bit wondering about uh, what's the plans about including other communities that work in a more shorter terms, like Google Summer of Code. I know that uh, OpenStack this year had uh, his first successful uh, incorporation with those people. Mm. So, how about those people that have shorter terms from working, and how you can include students there? Because not everyone is a professional. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's a fair question. Um, so this this year we have uh, participated for the first time to Google Summer of Code, and uh, we have been participating into another um, another program like that to incorporate new developers uh, called the Outreach Program for Women, um, and uh, we keep doing that. Um, w one of the things that I'm thinking of establishing is a more specific program for mentors. So um, a, a, an easier way for developers to find mentors so that they can be guided into the OpenStack way of doing things. But honestly, I think that we have done a lot of work on uh, inside the firms to educate them how to use open source or how to join open source projects on the legal aspects. And we have done it a lot on the engineering aspect. What we have not done very well or it's not very well known. It's uh, how to do that whole business processes and development process at the management level. So at the higher level than just the developers. We, we don't have, I, don't, there are, I haven't met companies where they have a very specific way of tracking KPIs for developers who work mainly upstream. 
they are, I mean, th there are companies where they trust their developers to do the good thing, or they trust their operators to be able to contribute upstream, or they have very vague uh, ways of, um, of um, assigning priorities and tracking those priorities. So there, there are companies where I've seen where the, the developers have to be able to land a patch within uh, a certain release cycle. So within Kilo, we need to have this support for this specific piece of hardware or hardware line. And it's sure, I mean, it's, a, it's something that you can measure. It's a very simple indicator. Um, but there are companies where it's not really that easy to, to, to say that, I mean, to identify a deadline and give a six months a window to achieve that, that, um, that, that milestone and, you know, get a promotion, get a bonus because you do that. Um, it's also very difficult to, to be accountable in, into this way, into this um, uh, frameworks of large collaboration. So uh, lots of managers get really get really confused by that, and they don't know how to act. And we we need to do a better job at uh, at that, at find out best cases, and uh, highlight what doesn't work for sure. And I I started this investigation, this research because of that, because I think that we're not doing a good job at this. We can improve. I'm Adrian Otto. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the development process that we're used to when we do Agile is a completely different development process that we do when we need to collaborate across companies. Um, to learn how to do Agile, there's lots of books, there's lots of resources, lots of training. Um, what resources do we have to learn the distributed uh, community development process? I haven't seen much. <laughs> uh, Yep. <laughs> cool. So uh, Raina here is uh, going to write something about this. And I think that there are other smaller articles. I think, um, now I don't remember the name of the authors, but there, there have been some descriptions of the open source way of doing it. It's called the open source way by, do you remember? Uh, no, the, the Fogel, yes. Carl Fogel, uh, the open source way. Uh, there are other there are other articles that you can find online if you look for the Apache way. Um, so, but I think they still talk about very uh, confined environments. And when OpenStack has changed, in my opinion, a lot of uh, of of has challenged a lot of these models because of its size, the size and the amount of people and companies involved. Uh, and the speed of it uh, at which it's moving, and the way it uh, is also managed. So the, the combination of things, where we don't have an, a dictator, we don't have a, uh, we have these elections every six months, who change might change the the uh, technical leaders. Uh, every six months, we may change the the priorities for the next cycle. For one cycle, we may be going fast towards new features. For another cycle, for the next six months, we're going to be refactoring all the code. And that confuses, throws people off a lot of the time. So um, it's hard. There are some places where we you can learn about how to apply the open source way to your, your Scrum, your ag Agile places. And I gave some, some suggestions. Like, even if you do Scrum, try to be summarizing everything in to summarize the results of your Scrum meetings and your sprint planning into a public place where other people can plug in. Um, but it's not just that. There, there is something more that needs to be done. And uh, we are at the beginning of a, of a journey, I think. How are we time? Other questions? Jim Roland Hagen. Um, going back to the release cycle, have we investigated other release cycle models other than the every six months um, that may be better for either users or developers? Um, like, I think a lot of times waiting six months to ship a product isn't really viable. True. So I think that there have been discussions about how to, ch 
tweaks and changes that we could do to the release cycle, um, there has never been a real uh, change. So because because it's it's hard. <laughs> Um, so initially we were releasing every three, three months at the very beginning and then we went to the six months. So one year is probably too long at this speed. Uh, we might think uh, there's going to be discussions next month, next week. Um, uh, sorry, starting tomorrow. It's already uh, here. Um, <laughs> about uh, uh, alternating cycles where there is one cycle with uh, focus on features and one cycle is more about fixing bugs and catching up with uh, paying off the, the technical debt. We'll see how that goes um, because some projects are suffering, suffering from that. And right, I mean, product, product releases over six months. So, you know, from that aspect also, there are, there are some operators where they try to stay close to trunk. So they, they never have the concept of a release. They basically release every day. Um, and some other operators are waiting for the new, for smaller clouds probably. They're waiting for the packages to come from Red Hat, Ubuntu, SUSE, um, other distributions out there. Thank you. No, I don't remember when I was supposed to finish. 20 after? Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks, everybody. <laughs>